My name is Simon Tran and I'm ProPublica's Events Associate. Welcome to Lessons Lost, the historical shortcomings of the Bureau of Indian Education. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. We're expanding our coverage in the Southwest, which covers Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah. Our partner, the Arizona Republic or accentral.com is the largest news organization in the state, primarily serving um, the, uh, this, the area of Metro Phoenix. It is the largest local site in the USA Today network, which includes more than 200 news sites across the country. Over the past year, ProPublica and the Arizona Republic collaborated on Lessons Lost, a series that looked into the disparities within the Bureau of Indian Education which serves over 46,000 students across 23 um, states. Um, uh, the series investigated the BIE's slow response during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, delays in equipping students with computers, and its inability to meet federal and special education requirements. Even with recent conversations on improving the Bureau of Indian Education, our reporting and panelists have demonstrated the need for reform and alternative education models more than ever. For our conversation today, we're joined by four panelists. Adrian Elliott, Senior Legislative Associate, Associate at the National Indian Education Association and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Joe, Gar Joe Garcia, Head Councilman of the OK Owinge Pueblo and a former two-term president of the National Congress of American Indians. Genevieve Jackson, McKinley County Commissioner, County Hunters Point board member, and a former superintendent who spent more than 35 years in many roles as an educator. And finally, we have Alden Woods, a reporter at the Arizona Republic in Phoenix. In 2019, he joined ProPublica's local reporting network to examine long-standing problems in the Bureau of Indian Education. Thank you to our panel for joining today. Also to our audience, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. Our moderator today is ProPublica reporter, Mary Huditz, who is a member of the Crow tribe and has covered Native American issues for more than a decade. Mary, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Simon. Um, and thank you also to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, at what I think is actually a notable moment in the history of the U.S. Bureau of Indian Education. Um, as some in the audience may know, the federal government's education system for Native children has its roots in a painful period known as the Indian boarding school era. Just this week, Interior Secretary Deb Holland announced that her department will conduct an in-depth review or investigation into the history of federal boarding school policies and the impact and trauma they've had on Native people. Um, much of our discussion today will actually be about the present day BIE. Um, it's an agency that serves some 40,000 Native youth in nearly two dozen states. Um, but to understand the present, I do think it's important that we take a moment to, to know and understand the past extent possible here. Um, so with that, Adrian, um, I'm hoping you could start us off and give us maybe a broad thousand foot perspective on the origins of the BIE um, and what you think we should know today about its history. Sure. Um, so I think the biggest thing to know is that whenever the United States began, the federal government entered into treaties with Native nations across the continent. And these treaties often included provisions that promised education for Native children in exchange for this land. And during the 1880s, exactly as you mentioned, um, the federal boarding school era really began in earnest. And this consisted of federal military facilities that had been used to fight tribes, which were converted into Indian boarding schools. And they were purposefully used because they were far from reservations, family, and community. And these, these schools became an essential component of the United States assimilation policy. Our students arrived to overcrowded classrooms thousands of miles from home where they were subjected to 
all a whole range of abuse. And by the time they left school, our students looked like different people. Um, they were often no longer able to communicate in their native language and they had um, been stripped of their cultures in many ways. Um, and we continue to learn the full scope of these schools. Um, <laughs> sorry, I told myself I wouldn't tear up, but I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to highlight and honor the 751 Native children that were found in unmarked graves um, in Saskatchewan today, and the 251 or 215 children that were found buried at Kamloops Indian Residential School, and the hundreds and thousands more that we continue to grieve and that we know are out there. And this is why NIA supports um, the initiative that Doug Holland um, started earlier this week, um, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. This policy continued through the 1970s and 80s and impacted generations of Native students and families. Um, we saw a change in the 70s um, when Congress passed the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act and later the Tribally Controlled Schools Act of 1988. And these laws created pathways for tribes to take control of the education for their students and to exercise self-determination in Native education. Today, the Bureau of Indian Education funds 183 schools across 23 different states. And 130 of these schools are operated by tribal nations, which is an enormous shift from where we've come. We have a long way to go, um, but recognizing this, these origins is really important to understanding where we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, so Adrian brought us to the present very, very, just was very well. Um, which kind of takes me to your reporting, Alden. Um, you started to explore and step into the world of looking at the Bureau of Indian Education um, more than a couple of years ago now, I believe. And I was curious, how did that work begin? And, and what was it um, that drew you to the work, to this reporting? Yeah, I, I don't think I can start to fully answer that question until I mentioned that the, the history that Adrian talked about, I, I grew up in Indiana and that history is not taught. That history is, is, is barely mentioned. So like uh, a lot of people in this country, I did not know that the BIE was a thing that existed until 2017. Um, I had just moved to Arizona and I saw a blurb, I can't remember where, about a group of students and their families who had gotten together uh, they were mem members of the Havasupai tribe in Northern Arizona, whose ancestral homelands are on the floor of and surrounding the Grand Canyon. Um, they'd gotten together and they had filed a lawsuit against the federal government over the conditions of their school. And I started reading the lawsuit and started having conversations with their attorneys and with, with folks who were involved in that um, and some of the families down there and learned of um, huge systemic problems. This school, um, I mean, some of the some of the allegations in that lawsuit, which has since been been settled, um, special education programs that were not nearly equitable with what you would see in a public school down the street from where I live in Phoenix. Um, staffing shortages that were so severe that you know teachers were teaching three or four grade levels at a time, um, and just tons of trauma that that these students were experiencing and that had not been proper. They did not have. The proper resources to deal with. Um, so I, I don't know of anybody who could hear about that school and not not want to know what what happened there and what's going on here. And so I started having more conversations and I discovered, you know, the school is run by the federal government. Oh my gosh, nobody taught me about that. I, I did not know that that was a thing, unfortunately. Um, I made it to 22 years old without knowing that that was a thing that still happened and not just a thing that happened in the past. Um, and so I started having conversations with folks who do know about yeah, and, and one of the, the things that came up over and over again is that the problems that we were seeing at Havasupai Elementary School um, were kind of extreme examples of 
other, other issues that had been identified throughout the system for decades. Um, and as, as the folks here know, who have been working on this a lot longer than I have, um, those stories are out there. Those stories have been told a lot, but they often, they often kind of follow the same path, which is um, there, are, there are schools, they are not equitable um, in many ways. And in many ways, they're incredibly successful at infusing culture and language and tradition, but in a lot of other ways that they are, they need some help. Um, but then the stories kind of stop there. And so we wanted to know why is that? Like, what is happening here? What is blocking this? Because there are people who are trying, we know that, um, at all levels of the system. So what is, what is blocking that? Um, and what, is, what needs to be done moving forward? And that's how we got here. Yeah. So, yeah, you say what needs to be done moving forward. Um, I'm actually curious. I would love to bring that to Councilman Garcia. Um, Councilman, in your community in, in New Mexico, um, you have the Oke Wenge Community School. Um, it's a tribally controlled school. And just short of a year ago, you were testifying in a congressional hearing about the needs of BIE schools. Um, curious, what in your view is the most pressing issue facing BIE? Well, the, uh, thank you for having me, number one. Uh, I, I must say that uh, it's not one simple uh, solution to all of the ailments that we, we find in the system. And the word system comes into play. It's a systematic problem that has persisted over years and years and years. And if the people that are running the schools have no idea about what Indian country is about, what Indian people are like, what their culture, tradition, language, and uh, learning styles and all of that is about, and yet they're thrown into the fire to try to promote education in the dominant society's ways. Well, that's almost a setup for failure. And so I think that's really one of the things that has happened. And because of the, the systematic situation that we are in, funding is a major, major part of it. And if you, if you know anything about the budgeting process, not a federal budgeting process, there's a hurdle after hurdle after hurdle on how you get the funding. And so unless the funding is, is appropriate to the level of need, you'll never get it done. And that's been the situation over the, the past years that I've been uh, around trying to help the education system. Uh, but I must say, we have gained a lot of ground and the PL 297 school is a significant measure of how successful, not BIE run schools, but BIE funded schools run by tribal government can be successful. And uh, I, I know of several of these schools that are top notch. Number one, okay, Winger for, uh, for elementary school is a, is a great little school. Santa Fe Indian School, uh, based out of Santa Fe, run by 19 tribes, is a major, major breakthrough on education. And so the, the, the um, reason for its success lies in the condition under, under which it, it's operated. That means the tribal governments are operating the, the Santa Fe Indian School, not the federal government. And so the funds are appropriated and the needs are, are based on the local uh, tribes and the student that attend. We have students from Alaska, from Oklahoma, from Montana, from South Dakota, North Dakota, California. And so the tradition and the culture and the language is a major part of that. So that's doing good. The other school that I will bring up is um, Cherokee uh, School school system in Cherokee, North Carolina. Now, they're a model that I looked at back in 1995, prior to 1995. They had already initiated being a PL, PL-100-297 school, tribally controlled school. They were doing wonders at that time. And so when Okewinge, when I became governor, that was one of my initiatives. I said, we're gonna break away from BIA and we're gonna run our own school and we'll do what we need to do. And so 
I think that's the big, big difference. And so why we are not able to take all of the other schools, uh, however many are left, and put them into PL 297 form, uh, again, it goes back to the federal situation because uh, BIE is not allowing the rest of the school to go under tribal control. They've already stopped that. And so uh, it probably is related to funding as well. But uh, the major hurdles have, have been addressed as of today and we're moving forward. So we can't say that what BIE, BIA used to be back then, uh, BIE has improved a whole lot. But primary reason why BIE even has improved is because now there's collaboration, there's consultation, there's working relationship between BIE official and tribal leaders and the, the uh, educational environment, if you will, and the people that work in that, like NIEA, the partner, and mm -hmm. many other organizations are partners, NCAI. And so I think that we're making progress, but if we could get that funding level to the appropriate level, man, we'd have a ball and we'd be in really, really good shape. But, uh, you know, that's sort of where we are right now. We're making progress. And uh, it, it is still important that you have to know the past in order to appreciate what's happening and why it happened and how, why it took so long. But if, if you know that, and, uh, I, I think what uh, Eldon said earlier that most of our congressional people that make the laws do not know that. Mm -hmm. And so it's an important, but it's a learning situation. So. Uh, you know, at, at NCAI, we created a, uh, what, uh, what I proposed a long time ago, that we need to create Indian 101, and all congressional people must pass that test, like they pass bar exams and whatnot. They oh. must pass that test in Indian 101 in order to become a full-fledged congressional person. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, I actually would love to ask the same question of you, Genevieve. I think Joe touched on a second ago um, about transitioning to uh, the, the, the work and the struggle of transitioning to kind of local control. And we'll get to that. But I'm curious, what do you feel like you need policymakers and lawmakers to know about your school? And what are the biggest issues you think BIE is facing? Oh, and you're on mute. My opinion of the BIA and the BIA is a little different. I, I'm from the boarding school era. And I would like for BIE and BIA to go away and not have anything to do with education for Native children. Because there are so many inaccuracies and there's dysfunctionalities within the bureaucracy that we don't get the funding that we should be getting. And also that we, we also play political games against one another. Uh, we've learned that too well from our Anglo culture, from the Anglo culture. But um, having local control is wonderful. And we fought long and hard for that back in the 60s to become 297 schools. And my school, Hunter's Point, is a, a locally controlled school and the community and the school board decides the language and the culture and what's to be taught in the schools. And with the BIA, with the BIE, it's a little different. They have to, their curriculum is a little different. But within the bureaucracy itself, what I mean by dysfunctionalities is that we have, a, there's a tendency to within BIE, as I understand it now, is that there's a lot of shuffling of people at the top and there's a shortage of staff and a high turnover so that no one at the, at the school levels can actually make a decision on things real simple like permission to go on a field trip. That becomes real problematic here. It may sound 
well, uh, like something that is hard to believe, but it does happen. But with the tribally controlled school, we can make those kind of decisions right away. And I also am a member of the Bozba, which is composed of um, representation from 66 tribal grant and um, BIE schools. And so we have a mixture of problems here. We have um, with the BIE, uh, like I said, they're very bureaucratic. And with the, with the tribal control schools, we have tribal support costs that allows us to make these own decisions. But if all our schools would go to tribal local control, I think that would say solve some of the problems. But I see again, the problems are at the top. And the top, by that I mean people in Washington who actually make the decisions within the BIE. They have a tendency not to address the issues. They pass the buck from one to another. And sure, things have improved, but not to the degree that we would like to see as it affects us down here at the local level. So there's a lot of room for improvement and we just have to keep pushing forward and keep pushing forward. And then also the congressional monies that come down has we've never had enough funding. Look at the Department of Defense and their schools. They get more funding for their education for those schools. Whereas uh, in native countries, and I'm talking for Navajo, we're understaffed. There's a shortage of teachers. We don't, we don't have, we like the books and the resources, but with the COVID grants that we've received, we have been able to do some catch up uh, right now because, but again, BIE again needs to take the lead and say, here is a plan to cover the next three years to improve broadband technology on the Navajo Nation. Here is a plan to address construction costs because right now we're competing with one another and we shouldn't have to compete. The school that I represent, Hunter's Point, was built back in the 60s. And so we have all kinds of problems within that school that we're constantly trying to fix. But then we, we may be tribally controlled, but still we have, there are some ties tied to BIA and to BIE the way that we need like, father may I, mother may I do this, father may I. And I think we need to do away with all of that and just address the shortcomings and, and, and address the curriculum and language, cultural. We, we, do, we need those changes to come without any um, interference. And if we could do that, if we could build a school within a three year time frame, the state schools do it all the time. Here in, in Indian country, it takes us 10 years. We have to compete against one another. And, and that's not fair at all. The money should be there. The congressional money should be there to meet the needs of the Native Americans because we were here first. This is our land and they owe it to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your point to the bureaucracy and um, sounds like the layers that go with seeking permission um, I think it's been about seven years now since the, you know, it sounds like it's still an issue, but that there were efforts to try to streamline things, um, I believe during the Obama administration and um, streamline the bureaucracy and make it easier to support schools and students. And I wanna actually stick with you, Genevieve, um, and ask from your perspective, like how, if at all, did that change things? Oh, very little. Like I said, everything is tied to funding. Mm -hmm. And during the Obama era, we were able to do some changes, but um, we, we, for the past four years, we, it's been a stalemate. And I, and I mean the people at the top. And uh, we don't really know what 
the people within BIE are doing or planning. And there's a high turnover of people there so that people are constantly shuffled around to acting status. We used to have what they call education line officers who could make decisions rapidly for schools. They had a certain region that they work in. Well, those ELOs are gone now. And now constantly, I said, there's a shuffle and that's true. You know, it, it's all across. And Navajo is so large that our problems are gonna be a little different from the little Indian schools that are in the, are in, in the United States. Hmm. Okay. Joe, can I ask you, Councilman Garcia, can I ask you as well? Um, and, and Adrian, um, like how have, in your perspective, I appreciate Genevieve's very much, um, how in your perspective have those reform efforts helped or succeeded? Um, and then also maybe what work is left to do? Well, uh, people keep talking about funding and funding is a dire need, but you got to remember or at least learn about the federal budgeting process. It's the president that proposes a budget. Within the president's proposal is the BIE and the BIA and all other funding for all other programs that make up the United States government, the, the departments and the, the administration and whatnot. And so whatever he proposes is based on the input given by the department themselves and OMB and uh, the Department of Treasury. And so whatever he proposes is really what they work by. Those are the guidelines. Now, if the BIA and the Department of Interior in this case is not proposing big, big funding level, well, the president not going to propose that. And you saw that last administration. I hate to be critical, but that is so doggone true. And with this, there is a, a difference in organizational structure of the tribal side. There is the Tribal Interior Budget Council, which I'm a part of. I represent the uh, Southwest tribes, that this process allows us to define the needs at all levels, BIE, BIA, all programs, and promote that. And we have devised ways by which we can improve that level of funding and propose it back up the chain so that the president is aware when he proposes his budget. So just to give an update on the 23 budget, which we've already proposed, uh, there's a 30% increase when well, President Biden had already increased for 2021, 2022, uh, there was a, about a 21% increase in funding overall, but now we're pressing 30% beyond that 21% increase. So almost 50% 50, 50 or more in funding to uh, Indian country, which does include BIE. Now, one of the big big issues with BIE is that the, the schools were built, as the uh, introduction, built, schools were built many, many, many moons ago, and so they have not been adequately uh, maintained because of the federal bureaucracy, and so that's one of the dire needs, and so at the rate that they were proposing at the federal level for funding, it would take 170 years to fix all of the schools that are in that bad of shape. And so at 170 years, we will no longer be here, but the problem will still be there. That's why it's going to take a monumental step in terms of funding for school construction alone. And so therein lies the difference about if we know the federal budgeting process, which we now do, we now know, uh, NIEA knows that because they that they also put a uh, a document together that shows where the funding is going to go, and the TBIC group does the same thing. NCAI does the same thing. So we have a better handle on that piece of it, but nonetheless, you can't just throw money at it. You gotta have plans, mm. and if if the BIE is not gonna have plans, while well, the tribes 
can have land be under tribal control for what they need to do. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot more discussion, but uh, I'll end it and yield my time to uh, Adriana. Thank you. Yeah, Adrian, what is, what is, what are NIEA, NIEA's priorities? And what is in the, the proposal that you have that Joe just referenced? Yeah, um, so I'll touch first on the question that Joe was talking about and then dive into that. Um, but I will first just say that one of the, one of the big, biggest things that Joe kind of touched on um, that has been a little bit of a success over the past couple of years has been the separation of the BIE and BIA budgets. Um, that per, historically the BIE has been within the BIA budget and this is very technical, so please bear with me. Um, but what that meant on the ground was just that BIE, even at the highest levels, couldn't sign off on even small contracts. Um, so if things were over a few thousand dollars um, to fix a school or to um, order laptops or um, to do whatever, the BIE couldn't even sign off on it. They had to go above their heads um, through BIA and often um, <laughs> through an entirely different process, which frustrated everybody. Um, and this separation of the budgets has started the process to be able to streamline that. So I, I do see that as a success. There's a long way to go, um, but that is one thing where I see a ray of, a ray of sunshine. Um, one of our biggest um, priorities has been infrastructure. And like Joe said, <laughs> it would take 170 years to fix all of our schools at the rate that the federal government has been proposing. And the problem isn't going away. Um, back in 2016, the um, Department of Interior's own Office of Inspector General um, produced a report. And in that report, they said that the backlog just on maintenance in schools was 430 million, but that the real need for emergent um, construction, and this is just emergent construction, not construction overall, um, was 1.6 billion. And since that time, the deferred maintenance has more than, has doubled approximately to over 725 million. Um, and we don't have an estimate on what the emergent construction is because those numbers um, we don't have an updated number from the Department of Interior. And so that has been a really big struggle that we continue to see is that our schools are not being updated at the rate that they need to be. Um, and it has become an even bigger problem during COVID. And as our schools are looking to come back from COVID, how can they reopen and make sure that their students are safe um, in regions that have been disproportionately impacted um, without um, with, with facilities that just aren't in the condition that um, we're meant to serve in this, this sort of environment. Um, one, of, one of the second big priorities when it comes to um, the BIE is capacity. Um, I know this was mentioned earlier on, um, but the GAO has a high risk list and the BIE is on that high risk list for federal programs. And one of the reasons that they cite the BIE is because the BIE does not have enough capacity to fulfill all of their programs. And currently, um, the BIE has 33%, sorry, 33 of positions that remain unfilled. And this over the past year has meant that a lot of our students in BIE schools, especially our special needs students um, and students with disabilities have not been able to access the um, resources that they've needed um, during the pandemic. And I think the perennial issue that you've heard over and over again is funding. Um, we have our general core funding accounts within the BIE and then other 
other funding accounts. And often um, that our schools will have um, certain funding accounts that are underfunded, for example, maintenance or operations, and then have to pull from that core funding, which is meant to fund their teachers and fund their um, fund <laughs> the general day-to-day -day operations of the schools. Um, and that means that they can't keep all of their um, they can't keep all of the positions filled, or they have to they have to sacrifice um, some of the the facilities um, repairs, and that deferred maintenance just continues to grow. Um, so this this is a systemic issue, um, and taking these little bites out of it and starting to try to um, address some some of the issues it, it is 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 really what, what we're trying to do, I, exactly as um, Councilman said at the beginning, there's not one single issue or one silver bullet, but those are just a few of our priorities. Yeah, robust. Um, I wanna underscore the conditions um, within the facilities. Um, so it's actually come up, I think, with each of our guests. Um, Alden, it's, it's stunning. It was stunning to like read those initial reports. I think you said it was back in six, 2016. It's stunning that it'll take so many years um, at the current rate to fix it. Um, here at Alden, I wonder if you could help us and our audience like understand really like the from your reporting what the conditions were um, based on what you observed or like or read through documents. What, yeah. What, the learning and yeah the the big one that that comes up in in my conversations with tribal leaders tribal educators is internet access i'm thinking of of miss jackson's school um where uh, i think you've i think you've told me before correct me if i'm wrong that sometimes when the wind blows too hard the internet is spotty and goes out sometimes i've, I've walked through schools where um, my cell phone reception goes away in the middle of a school and that that causes problems with with testing with um doing lessons online with with things like that um, I'm also thinking of, of sections of Miss Jackson's school, Hunter's Point, um, just south of Window Rock, um, where the last time I visited there, there were multiple sections of the building that had big signs where the doors were locked and it said, warning, don't come in here. We think this building might be unsafe or this part of the building might be unsafe. Um, I mean, tra traveling, traveling across the BIE system is kind of a trip because there are some, there are some buildings, the newer buildings um, are beautiful and and stunning, and especially the ones that have had real community input and been built in the last few years, um, you can tell that there's real thought and, and money and funding and time that's been put into them. But there's others, um, I'm gonna use Miss Jackson School as another example where the, there's a leak in the dorm that just can't, can't get fixed and there's kids sleeping in there and it snows in Window Rock in the winter. And that's a problem that just, at least the last time we had spoken to them, hadn't been fixed for a long time. Um, and so again, as everybody has said, these are problems that have been known for a long time. I think these are the funding and the condition of the building is probably the number one thing that if, if anybody knows anything about BIE, I think that's probably the number one thing that, that folks jump to. Um, and there have been some, there was the Great American Outdoors Act that passed, um, I believe near the end of the Trump administration, that's gonna kick some funding into repairing and replacing some of these BIE schools. Um, but still the, the, the attrition is, is very high at this point. Yeah, Ms. Jackson, um, did you have any, I know your school just was mentioned, do you have more to add? Um, I actually have a question for you, but yeah, on the conditions of the schools, if you do anything to know that we should know. Well, like I said, Hunter's Point was built back in the 60s, early, early 60s. And um, competing, competing against one another for these for new school construction. We shouldn't have to do that. And although Adrian mentioned that there's a separation now between BIE and BIA, it's still, there's a quagmire, a quagmire of problems there because if we want to replace a window, we have to go to BIA. We have, there's certain construction things we have to go and get permission from BIA for. And then they have a system called the Maximo system where all problems have to be entered in there. And sometimes I wonder just how long uh, 
the list of problems are from all the schools on Navajo, let alone the rest of the United States and the smaller schools there. So, um, and Alden mentioned, yes, there's a, we have, we have a broadband problems there. Uh, during this COVID year, we were able to get all our students uh, a computer to use at home. And we also had to set up MiFi's and hotspots and so forth. But I said, you know, why can't we just erect one tower right around Hunter's Point that would give services to all the people in that area? And then again, some of our people, our parents do not have electricity. And then again, some of them don't have plumbing, indoor plumbing or water. So we, what we had to do was um, we ordered water by the gallons and bottles and we gave it out to the parents. And we also made sure that each child had a, a MiFi or a hotspot. And I know in that same area with the public schools, they had the buses stationed in strategic areas so students could access those um, lessons from their teachers. So it, it's, it's a host of problems and it just underscores the need for funding across Native American communities. Even before the COVID happened, we had all these problems. And now after COVID, the problems are still here. Well, the, re the resources that we have, they came about, some of them came about due to the COVID, like the extra funding for, for school resources. Um, you know, we appreciate that very much, but what BIE needs to come up with a strategic plan on how to address these issues. They needed, they were told to do a three-year plan. Okay, that expired in March 2021 for infrastructure and for broadband technology. It, they just seem unable to do a plan that would address these needs on, on Indian country. And as long as there's not a plan in place and a list of priorities or which schools need the most um, funding or which schools, you know, we, we shouldn't have to compete against one another. We should take care of all these problems, but we can't do it. We're unable to do it because the funding's not there. And it goes back to Congress again. It goes back to the president. How would just, how friendly are they or how do they feel against, with the Native Americans? So that makes a big difference in the funding that we receive. And, it's good to paint a nice picture, but the reality for me at Hunter's Point and coming from a very rural area, the problems are still there. I live in a Hogan and I have, I have access to electricity and running water, but my iPad, my little iPad that I use right now, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And when the wind blows a certain way, I lose all contact. I can't even get a phone call where I live. And it's the same problem with the students in the rural areas. So these are the problems that are still there. Yeah. And we need a plan, a strategic plan from BIE or from BIA or even from Congress on how to address these problems. And that's why I said BIE, BIA needs to go away because there's just a host of issues that they are unable to address just give us the education give it back to us the whole uh yeah. hit and caboodle where we make decisions ourselves and what we need and let us address our own problems we can do it we can take care of ourselves we mm -hmm. don't need bie and bia interference I do realize, yeah, in your work um, that you're also, in addition to providing the education, um, you might have like a robust uh, and like you might be offering, you might be more than just a school to a community. Um, and I think I'd like to ask Councilman. Um, 
um, I'd like to ask you, Councilman, um, what, <laughs> what, um, what are your, like, how do you see your school kind of as a tribally run school or tribally controlled school, like serving your community um, like, in the, in the pandemic, like the, the outside of the classroom? Well, um, uh, our school is right near the administration building. And because I'm an electrical engineer by profession, uh, mm -hmm. I know about technology. Uh, I know about telecom, I know about broadband. And uh, what's odd is that I've been pushing broadband the way broadband is, is a technology available today, like 10, 15 years ago, promoting in local communities all across in the land. We need to be ready for a, a telecom at that point, but now it, it's broadband. And so uh, people would not listen because I think mostly because they didn't understand the technology and the need for it in terms of broadband and computer systems and whatnot until oddly the COVID is what drove people to now understand, hey, that technology has a place in, in uh, assuring that we can do much better for our children, our communities and whatnot. And so the effort came on. Came on. And so we're able to do a lot of that. But here is a, a, a keen point that people may miss. And that is that in our location at Okeowinga, the tribal government is partly responsible for having the backbone to have broadband available. The BIE and the school, the funding part of it is just, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do a connect. Okay, and provide that service. But what I see out of cause Indian country and Navajo is part of this is that the tribal government itself is also responsible for helping to build the infrastructure. But the BIE, if their BIE run facilities have also the, uh, that they need to provide the services when that infrastructure is in place. But if the infrastructure is not in place, uh, I think it's not BIE's responsibility. They can be responsible up to a level, but it's really the local tribal governments and other funding sources to put that infrastructure in place. And that's what we're seeing with the American Rescue Plan. And I think with the Job Act, we may be able to see a lot more of that, but we're not uh, out of the, uh, the forest yet but we're headed in the right direction. And so I think we need to continue building. And while I agree with the, uh, the planning part, uh, one thing is that I don't think the BIE or the BIA should come up with the plan because they come up with a plan and the, maybe the best plan in the world, but if they can't implement it, then what's the point? We've got to do it the tribes and the school system, the local government, and at, at the national level, maybe that's what we need to do as tribal leaders. We need to develop the plan and use BIE as a partner, not let them and put it on their hands because if, if they're already failing the rest of the parts, what are they gonna put in place? We have the know-how, we have the experience, we have the contact, we have the partnership locally and around the, the, our local places. So we can do a lot better doing and developing the plans and then implementing them ourselves. So I think that's really the approach that it's gotta be in. We are doing part of that at NTAI, at the uh, Federal uh, Communication Commission. I serve on the uh, FCC Tribal Leaders Task Force. And so we've identified how we can do that, but it goes then back to what keeps coming up is, okay, we need adequate funding. There's some of it that should be our own responsibility to provide base funding if we can to help move it along and then count on uh, the congressional and the president budget to uh, find more funding to, to build in. It's not gonna be all built in what, at one time. It's gotta be a phased approach. And that's what that strategic plan really should call for is a phased approach 
of how you build and you build and you build until you get to the level where you're you're satisfied. But okay. here's the here's the other offshoot, and that is that because I am technical, I've always stressed in Indian country in Indian education. Yes, do your culture, do your language, do your tradition. You have to know that. I'm a fluent speaker of my language through and through. And you gotta have that for our children. But the other piece is that we've been weak in the technology, what they call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's been a promotion just in the past seven years or so that we need to incorporate that part of it into our education system so that our students are well-rounded so that they can go anywhere they need to. And most of the time, if we ask them to come back to help our community, well, then we're doing our job. And I think that's the, the bottom line, but it, it, that's why I keep saying, it's not one uh, way that's going to fix it. It's gonna be a numerous ways. And all of those have to be incorporated into a comprehensive plan for Indian country. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on that with a lot of other tribal leaders as we speak. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, so some different perspectives here. Um, also some agreement on big things like funding. Um, we have so much more to discuss, but I know that we also have an audience with us and they have perspectives and they have questions too. Um, so we're gonna transition over um, to those questions and hope we can keep wrapping in and touch on everything we're hoping to get to here today. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. And thank you everyone for your answers. Um, we have just maybe 10 more minutes or so left. And so we're gonna try and get as many questions as possible. So try to keep your questions short. Um, my first question is, um, Understanding that our institutions and families can control only so much, and this is um, a question from someone who's a Native American. Um, what can tribal governments, Department of the Interior, BIA, BIE combined to help promote infrastructure to meet more than a minimum standard and bring a standard that will help students of all ages advance academically? Um, and um, anyone can take this, but just keep your answer short. Well, it depends on which kind of standard you're talking about. You're talking about educational level, uh, educational standards, which are set by uh, Department of Education. The Department of Ed requirements and legislative requirements, uh, BIE needs to be uh, at the table. And the tribes need to be at the table with BIE so that it's not BIE blindly accepting requirements set forth by uh, a non-Indian entity that is set up for public school and not necessarily for tribal school. But if it's education, that kind of education has got to be comprehensive enough so that it covers all grounds at the all levels, at the right levels, no matter who that person is. And so if we're already lacking, you see, we have to come up to speed and there got to be special effort to bring that up to that level. And so it'll take a lot of effort to get us to that level. And once we're at that point, then it can be a standard throughout and we can meet those standards and it's not going to be a big issue. But uh, mm -hmm. the standard has to include our perspective, our tradition, our culture, our language, our history, and the predicament that we've been in because of the education system in this country, what what uh, Secretary Holland brought up about the boarding school era, you know, we have to accept that we can't we can't keep denying that it happened. And yeah. so once we accept that and report out, and more people know about it, maybe that's a shining light at the end of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Now, and I, so I know Alden, you want to talk a little bit more for that. I also had a question, so feel free to answer that. But uh, Adrian and Alden, I had a question for you about new policy efforts being um, pursued at the federal level. People are talking about the Biden administration, what is changing, what isn't, what um, are the plans to address this situation? 
Uh, I wanted to, to add, just add something and then I, I can hand that over to Adrienne to answer the, um, the work that they're doing on the federal level, but maybe not traditional infrastructure, um, but I think it's worth highlighting some of the efforts that tribal governments have been making to build their own systems within the system of BIA funded schools. Um, the, the effort that um, Choctaw Tribal Schools has been doing that, I know uh, Councilman Garcia mentioned um, the Cherokee schools out in New Mexico the, or North Carolina. Um, those are school systems that have been established and have been um, running and been kind of held up as models for a long time. And then we are also seeing um, the Navajo Nation working on a similar proposal of kind of building a, uh, a, a Navajo school system of the BIE schools and kind of assuming some more of the administrative responsibilities. We saw um, just in the last couple of years, the Hopi tribe took a grant from uh, the Department of the Interior and, and uh, finally took control of all of the schools on the Hopi reservation and put, brought those all under tribal control and then hooked them together into one unified school system. So we are seeing, um, there, there is a real effort that we are seeing now. It, it feels like there's momentum building toward um, tribes kind of finding a way inside of the system to build their own system and then uh, assume more responsibilities on it that way um, and, and uh, assume more control of how education happens on their land. Um, and then of course, in, in smaller, um, smaller nations that might only have one or two BIE schools, like that's kind of pre-existing as is so when that school converts that whole system is kind of there already but that feels like momentum that is happening right now um, well the, uh, if i may uh interrupt uh, i know it's happening in north and south dakota too they've got the, they've got some good tribal schools there tribal control schools and so the momentum is is at all different levels and so if, if you want some uh, uh sightseeing that y'all might want to do when when it opens back up you got to go visit the the north and south dakota schools because they're doing great wonders up there too and and it's like everybody else great wonders in the midst of low funding uh inadequate staffing and all of that we're still doing well so uh that's that's a promise that we have and it's indian country doing it not the bie I also would like to say, this is Genevieve. Thank you, Alden, for bringing up those points and to the gentleman here from Okie Wingate. Uh, again, I keep going back to the issue of the larger tribes versus the small tribes. It's so much easier for small tribes to convert to 297 and take care of some of the systemic issues or address them. Whereas in Navajo, where we, we are in four states and we have 66 grant travel and BIE schools within Navajo. It's gonna take longer time or it's gonna take more work for us. And we are making baby steps, little baby steps. I'm not saying everything is uh, at a standstill. We are making baby steps because we have schools that excel, but again, we are so huge that sometimes we have a tendency to trip ourselves in the, in the bureaucracy that we have. Yes, the tribal government has a part to play in the education of its students. And we have public schools who are on Navajo. We have parochial schools on Navajo. So you have that whole uh, realm of um, schools. Some, some are with Arizona standards, some have New Mexico standards, and then the tribal schools uh, have their own standards and Navajo standards and so forth. So we have to come together and look at all these standards and find out what works best for us as a Navajo nation. And we haven't arrived at that point yet because maybe because of the largeness of our nation, I don't know, but um, we, 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 are, we do have schools that, are ex that excel, but they're few. 
and some are in Arizona and some are in New Mexico. But what, what I said a while ago was that BIE had a, was mandated by Congress to make a plan to address the broadband issues. They were to come up with a three-year plan. They didn't do it. So we need to be at that table when it does, when they decide to get together and address these issues. The Native Americans need to take the lead in how to address the educational system within their schools. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Adrian, I'll, um, we'll close with you. So if you um, wanted to talk about the policy efforts being pursued, but then also thinking about kind of talking about infrastructure, right? People also talk about the Department of Interior as well, right? And kind of how there was maybe uh, this management or kind of, um, you know, there was resources kind of, you know, there was challenges with that. Can you Tell us about what you think, you know, the work that you're doing needs to be pursued and the things that need to be specifically addressed. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so when it comes to infrastructure, I think it was Genevieve mentioned earlier today that despite the um, separation of BIE and BIA budgets, the infrastructure for BIE and construction continues to be within BIA. And so a lot of, for the construction of our schools um, and all, all of these issues continue to lie within BIA, which can creates a lot of this um, additional channels of communication and additional levels of bureaucracy as you can imagine, um, for a, many of our schools, right? Um, and it, it has created some, um, the bureaucracy of it has created some systems where um, some, some of our schools have been built and are beautiful with um, a great deal of tribal consultation. And, um, others have been built in areas that didn't have as much consultation. And um, for example, um, the buses didn't fit in the garage or the, <laughs> the, um, the, there were light switches that were built in the desert and Sam got in and now the light switches don't work. Um, and so they just weren't built for the environment that they were in. And, their new building. Um, it is beautiful, but it wasn't built um, with the consultation of local um, local tribal um, folks, and therefore it's just not up to the standards that it could have otherwise been. Um, and it's not serving our students in the way that it could have. Um, so I think that that's, that's one big issue when it comes to infrastructure. Um, that we haven't necessarily discussed that needs to be addressed as we talk about the need for additional funding when it comes to infrastructure as well. Um, I think too, um, another big issue when it comes to broadband is again, the layers of bureaucracy that come in. Um, for example, there was a school, um, Taos Day School, um, because of the type of school that they were. Um, they tried to get broadband through their local provider, which would have been $170 a month. Um, and instead, because it was, they were chartered through the federal government, um, or they had to go through a federal contract, um, which required multiple different um, contracts for this broadband agreement, um, they now have to pay $1,600 a month for their broadband, which is an insane difference, right? Um, and so this, these, are, these are small, <laughs> these are little issues that create really big challenges, right? Um, one other big thing that NIA has been working on um, when it comes to capacity building is building pathways to for teachers um, into 
Native communities. And that's really bringing our Native teachers home and um, making sure that our students have teachers who look like them, who understand them in the classroom. And then also teachers who maybe aren't Native, but are um, really passionate about making sure that Native students have a great education, making sure that they have the professional development that they need to be fully serving our students. Um, and so we, we have been working with folks on the Hill on multiple pieces of legislation for that. Um, and then the, the last thing that I'll mention is Native language. Um, we've seen, um, we saw the reauthorization of the Esther Martinez um, the Esther Martinez um, reauthorization a couple of years ago, um, but we continue to need progress in this, this area. COVID hit our communities really hard and especially our elders um, who for many of us are our knowledge keepers and our language keepers. And um, <laughs> there have been stats that many who are on this call will probably know that there are 250 some odd native languages here in the US, but if there isn't urgent action taken by um, 2050, there will only be about 50 native languages. Um, and so making sure that our students and especially our younger students in our early childhood education and our head starts um, have access to teachers and to native language programs is another critical component of um, ensuring that our students have the resources that they need. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone on this call. Um, that's our time for today. We went a little bit long, but that's okay, because I think that this is a really important conversation. Um, I just wanna say it was an honor to produce this event. Um, I just want to thank all our panelists, Adrian Elliott, uh, Joe Garcia, Genevieve Jackson, and Alton Woods, and for this, um, our, our amazing moderator, Mary uh, uh, Hudetz, who um, jumped into this and just an amazing job. Um, thank you, everyone, to our audience uh, for joining us today, for your questions as well. Thank you uh, for Simon, the Arizona. I got Virtual a question. Public. Yes. Uh, there were there were some questions in the chat box, and if, yes. if you would forward them to us, and uh, we can answer them and send them back to the for uh, sure, absolutely, uh, yes. originator. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and thank you again. Uh, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email tomorrow with the full video um, for everyone who registered. Um, but thank you so much again, and have a good night.